favorite television program other than sports is Jeopardy. If we're home in the evening, it comes on at 6.30, we almost always watch it. What I like about Jeopardy, besides the fact that it challenges my mind, is that there are 61 clues and, and answers in a, in a half hour. You know, most things, the Wheel of Fortune guys like that, there's only like five or six quizzes in a, in a half hour. But Jeopardy gives you a bunch of them. Lisa and I are pretty good players. Mm. Now, I doubt that I would be very good under the pressure of the uh, live studio audience and being on television and having two other people there trying to ring in. Uh, but from my recliner, I'm killer. <laughs> as long as I don't get Shakespeare. But also, I'm a very good guesser. And I figure out what the category is going to be, and I can make a good guess at it. Um, one of the things that we do is when they, at the end of the program, before the last set of commercials, they always say, now here's Final Jeopardy, and your category is, and they tell you the category. And Lisa and I try to guess what the question is going to be about. And it's not unusual for us to get it right. And you know, we just, we have a sense of, okay, what is, what's been hot in the news or whatever lately? Uh, British literature, it has to have to do with Harry Potter. Sure enough, the question is on, it's got something to do with Harry Potter. Now, the writers of the quizzes on Jeopardy are very clever. They develop uh, interesting categories. They use a lot of humor, a lot of wit. But once you get the category figured out, the guys that start in the middle drive me crazy. Because if you start at the top, they're easy, but you can figure out the category now. So you start at the top, work your way down. And uh, it becomes easier to guess. Now, there are two particular categories that I don't care how good you are, you can't just guess them right away. One is called miscellaneous, and the other is called potpourri. And what that is, that's just leftover questions. They ran out of time and they had two questions left in the category about World War II, and so they saved them and they just threw one of them in here. Okay? When Ben and I prepare sermons, we both like to work in series. So we study a topic, we study a text, and we amass ideas, we determine what it is that we're going to teach, and we organize all our thoughts into some sermon concepts. It's not uncommon for us to have leftovers when we're done. That just didn't seem to fit in one of the sermons that we were going to do, and so we, what do you do with them? Well, I put them into a sermon. Now, I've never entitled a sermon a miscellaneous or potpourri, so, and I still haven't, so I called it marginalia. <laughs> this is a, some miscellaneous collection of biblical principles and some practical suggestions about giving that just didn't fit in the other sermons, and we don't want to drag it out any longer. We think three is enough. But I'm going to start with the biblical principles. I want to thank you for continuing to come back, even though I warned you that, that the next two weeks I was going to be preaching about this, and you, stuff, you kept coming back, so I thank you for that. So let me talk about the biblical principles. Three of these, you've heard them already, but a little bit differently, and one is just a little bit new. But here's the first one. God owns everything. He trusts us with some of it. Psalm 50, uh, God says, uh, verses 10 and 11, I don't need anything from you. I don't need the bull or lamb or goat you bring, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. Everything's mine. By the way, this is a little side note. This is just kind of funny. Look that up in the King James, and it says something like this. I will take no bull from your house. <laughs> I thought, man, that could be a good theme. But I think that's thinking a different direction. And this is everything. God owns everything. Everything that you have is on loan from God. It's not yours. It belongs to God. You're just borrowing it. Edwin Hughes was a preacher, and he preached about this, and apparently he offended one rich man in his congregation. So the next, that man came and said, said, I want to take you to lunch tomorrow. So he took him to lunch. And then after lunch, he said, I want you to come see my place. And he took him up to where he lives. And it was an, an absolute estate. It took a while just to go see the whole thing. And he got done, he said, now, I want to ask you something. Are you telling me that none of this belongs to me? And Hughes just said, well, why don't you ask me that 100 years from now? That man didn't own anything. He was in charge of a lot. But he didn't own it. He was just managing. Jesus told a story one time about a man who was rich. And uh, he had a, a guy that was managing his possessions for him. Well, someone accused that manager of, of mismanaging money. And uh, so the rich man said, you're going to come in and give me an account. Well, knowing that he was going to get the you're fired, he took action. And one of, their, one of their creditors, or one of the people that uh, owed them money, owed them uh, 800 gallons of olive oil. So he told the guy, look, give me 400 and we'll call it even. And another guy owed 1,000 bushels of grain. He said, give me 500 and we'll call it even. Now, Jesus said that the manager's purpose 
was to make friends that would help him out after he got fired. In explaining the moral of the story, Jesus said this, the master commended, get that, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And then Jesus concluded, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be also be dishonest with very much. You get the point? It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. If you can't prove yourself, God knows what's going on. God entrusts possessions to us. And those who prove faithful with what he has already loaned us, he rewards with more. But not so that we can just bask in the glory of all of our possessions. See, it's always so that it can be part of God's plan to carry out his mission in the world. Now, whether it's famine relief in Romans 15, or care for the widows in 1 Timothy 5, or building a worship facility in Exodus 25, or support of God's leadership in Deuteronomy 18 and Philippians 4, God's plan is always that his people would provide the required resources to carry on his mission, and they would do so out of what he has already given them. See, it's not that God needs our money. It's his money anyhow. When you give, you're not giving your own money. You're giving God money. You're just giving it back to him. And this is how he chose to pay for his mission. He gives to us according to what he believes we can handle. And then we give some back. Or not. The second biblical principle is that giving to God's work is a doorway to blessings. Now, we've said this several times in this series already. God wants to pour out blessings on us. He wants to make us blessed. He wants, us to, he wants to give us more blessings than we can even handle. He wants to meet our need, but not necessarily our greed. Now, I know it, it seems like God has given a lot to some people who are not very generous. Some people who, they don't seem to recognize that He is the giver. Well, He gives it because He knows they're capable of being generous with it. Not that they necessarily will, but they're capable. And if he gives someone a lot, it's because he knows they can handle it. And if they don't, they will give an account one day. And understand, and this is important, friends, each man will be held accountable according to what has gifted him. In, other, in another application of the Luke 16 story, Jesus said, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, your riches, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Jesus wants us to think about that. If, if, you know, if you can't even prove yourself with what I have given you, do you expect me to give you any more? The man who is selfish with his blessings is so because he doesn't believe in eternal consequences. See, he chooses to sacrifice eternity for the now. You know, I want to have lots now. And if God holds me accountable because I didn't do act faithfully with it, well, I'll take it. But he doesn't believe it anyway. <coughs> so he amasses work for today. But what good's that after his seven or eighty years on earth is over? You see, we keep the doorway to blessing open when we give unselfishly. As one very rich man said, someone asked him, how can you give so much? Because he was one of these guys that gives huge, huge amounts. This is great. He said, I shovel it out and God shovels it in. God has a bigger shovel than me. <laughs> Third biblical principle here is that giving is an easy way to check our obedience. Now, giving is, understand, it's always strictly voluntary. No one comes to your door and, and with a gun and tells you what you have to give. We don't even ask you what you give. We don't, we don't look and see what it is. All obedience is voluntary. Obedience isn't a matter of earning favor with God. See, we've already got His favor. If you have anything at all, it's because God has blessed you. But obedience is a response of love, saying, God, I, I recognize what you are and who you are. And here's my response. And so by choosing to obey in our giving, we demonstrate our love for God and our trust in God. Of course, the reverse is true. When we don't, we demonstrate that we really don't love Him that much. We don't trust Him very much. Now, God has, in fact, commanded His people to give a tithe. We talked about it last week. That's a command. That's not a, a take it or leave it thing. That's a command from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is valid today. We can each measure our own level of obedience by whether we do or don't obey God right there. You just look at your own checkbook and you can tell if you're being obedient. Right? Number four is that when God produces in you a desire to give, He also gives you the blessings to carry it out. He gives you the blessings to manage. God will never ask you or move you to give more than you can afford. Bottom line is every person can afford to tithe because whatever you have is just 10% of what you have. I remember reading about a missionary 
um, who is, I don't know where it is, Africa or something, or some, some uh, jungle type village, and there's a knock at the door, and there's this little boy holding a fish. And uh, the guy just said, what's this? He said, well, this is my tithe. He goes, why? He said, well, you said that I should tithe uh, at, at church. He said we should tithe 10%. And uh, so here's my tithe. He goes, well, where are your other fish? He said, well, they're still in the river. I've got to go catch them now. <laughs> See, whatever God has given you, you have enough to tithe. No one can, no one can not tithe. Okay? Um, he has already blessed you with enough to give. And God who owns everything has loaned it to you. And that's all he asks. And He will supply and increase your wealth. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. If you obey Him. Now let's look at some practical <coughs> ideas that I think can help you become a generous, obedient giver. Take them or leave them. It's up to you. Now I don't know who originated this first thing, but he, this, I just love this. There are three kinds of givers, this guy said. Uh, the first one is a flint giver. Flint givers need a spark to motivate them. Uh, they respond to a special request, a special plea, a uh, special need. They're moved by some particular event, maybe a hurricane, so they, they give to the hurricane relief, or uh, somebody sets up a GoFundMe page for a, a fallen hero. And they, it's not wrong to be a flint giver, but understand, it tends to be limited and inconsistent and certainly not dependent. A second kind of giver is a sponge giver. Sponge givers give only when they've been squeezed. Somebody guilted them into donating to a worthy cause, or they, or they give uh, just so that the giver, the asker, will leave them alone. But their hearts aren't in it. But you can put enough pressure on some people, they'll pony up. Then the third givers, he says, are honeycomb givers. They just ooze giving. No one has to spark them. No one has to squeeze them. Their hearts are set on being generous. It's their very character. They recognize that God has blessed them to be able to help His mission. Honeycomb givers don't mind giving because they know that, don't worry about it, God's just going to give me more so I can do more. Now of the three, only honeycomb givers truly reflect the image of God. Because there's no selfish motive, no hidden agenda. They just simply share their blessings because they know it belongs to God and He gave it to them for a purpose. And part of that purpose was to give to others. Now, for those who are not already faithful, generous, obedient tithers, I have some suggestions to help you become a tither. You can try this. Uh, these are they're not just my own. Other people think the same thing. But these are things that I believe. And I'm going to do, start today. Okay? Don't, don't wait. Take that bold step and act right now. If you believe what God says, if you believe the Word of God, then start today. I want you to understand something. Satan does not want you to be blessed. He does not want you to obey God so that God would turn and bless you. He does not want you to enjoy all that God has prepared for you. He schemes how He might keep you from obeying God. He plans how to cause you to not ever give, to put it off for another day until you cannot, you, suddenly you realize, I don't have any money left, I can't do it. Don't let Him win. So start today. Secondly, is to give regularly. A very clear statement about giving uh, found in the Bible uh, is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes about the collection for God's people. This is giving in church. It's just like what we did a little bit ago, passing this plate. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money and keep him with his income. Okay? And he's making tithe right there. He doesn't say the word. He doesn't need to. That's the standard that everyone understood. Now the key isn't necessarily that it's done every week. The key is that it's regular. Okay. If you're like me, uh, you know, I get paid every two weeks. So every two weeks I write that check. And that's the first thing we do before we do anything else with our, with our income. We write that check for our offering. And one way Satan wants to keep you from obeying God is to make you forget about it. So if you don't, do it, if you don't make it a habit, a regular habit, Satan will make you forget about it. And then you will pay some bills and you will see something online that you have to have and you will order it. And then you'll put some money aside because you, you, you put a down payment on this nice vacation. Maybe it's a, a cruise or something like that. And then you look at, oh, I forgot my offering. I don't have any money left. So that's Satan at work. The best way to, de to defeat him is to just make it a regular thing. That's automatic. You don't even have to think about it. Now I want you to notice how the apostle says, each one of you, not, not just a few of you, not just, as we talked about, only 5% of Christians tithe, the other 90% don't believe God. Or 95%. 5% of 
5% do it, okay? Paul says, each one of you. You know, many parents teach their children how to, how to do that by giving them some money every week when they come to church. I hope you do that. You know, you add, they know and you know, we all know, it's your money, it's not the kid's money, it's, he's not digging out of his own pocket, but it just teaches him the, the mechanics of bringing that offering and saying, God, I love you, and here it is. Or maybe it's a portion of their allowance. That was, that was my life. You got an allowance? 10% of it was a tie. That's, it, was, it was a regular activity. I never had to learn it again. Um, and it continued all the way into today. And it will for your kids. Okay, so give regularly. Thirdly, give according to your blessings. And Paul says each one should set aside some of money and keep them with his income. That's consistent with tithing. And you know, we saw, we talked about it last week. And I talked about it last night at worship last night. That's a legitimate biblical standard, and it's truly a command. And, and, and as the Bible says, when we're stealing from God when we don't do that. Okay, but tithing is only a standard to start with. That's not the end. That's just the start. And then your other offerings are beyond that. And again, I realize the New Testament does not have the words, you must give a tithe. Okay, but the Old Testament does. And the Bible says that all Scripture <coughs> is inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let me re-say that. The Old Testament command to tithe is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in giving so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to give the way God called him to. The Old Testament equips us to do what God calls us to do. Okay? Number four, give to God first. Make that the first thing you do. Do the math. You know what your income is. Do the math. And you, you see what your income is? Do the math. 10%. Give, set that aside before you pay your bills. Before you do your wants and have tos. Because if you don't, if you try to turn that around, you try to pay all the other stuff first, I guarantee you, you will find yourself and you cannot afford to tie. Because it's all gone. And again, that's Satan working on you. Be like that little boy with the fish. Proverbs calls that the first fruits. The first fish he caught, he brought in for his tie. And he said, I'm going to go catch the other nine. That's what we ought to be like. As soon as you get paid, set that aside and don't touch it for any other reason. Number five, tie it to your church. Whether our church or whatever, if you go to a different church normally, tie there. When God established the tie, it was specifically to support his congregation. All of the ministry portion of the national government of Israel was paid through the tithes. And our church depends on it. Our church operates on the tithes of our people. You know, we don't go out and ask anyone else for money. We don't take any government money. We don't go out and, 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 and have a thing at the fair where everybody comes in and, and pays for our church. Uh, by, we sell them beef and noodles or whatever, the chicken or whatever the different people sell out there. We don't do that. But you know something? Our current budget, our current budget requires $70 a week per family, per giving unit. I'm okay with math. To do the math, what that means is we only have to average $37,000 a year per family to meet our budget. Do you think that most of our families live on only $37,000? I think we live on a lot more than that. And I'll tell you, there's a blessing that you can expect when you give to your church. And that is that you'll fall in love with your church. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your heart will always follow your treasure. That's just universal, and that is absolute. When you give to your church, you'll care about the church. You'll care about the other people that sit in the church with you on Sunday morning. You'll care about how the church works. You'll care, you'll care about the building, and you'll care about the future, and you'll care about the leaders, and you'll care about those children that we saw in the, in the video, because you'll just simply fall in love with your church. Your heart will follow your money, and, and when, they, when you do, you'll still have plenty left over to support other missions and other ministries that you're a part of, and as the Bible says, <coughs> you'll be able to excel in the grace of giving. Number six, give to special purposes. Okay, now your tithe, that's just your offering. That's your general offering. And then you can support other things as well. And that's what God did when he wanted Israel to build their first worship center. He told Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. That you are to receive the offering for me, and each man whose heart prompts him to give. Now go back and read the story, and you'll find that not only did they obey that, they did it so well that Moses had to go and say, stop! Quit bringing money in! I love to. Yeah. <laughs>
Number seven, give in different ways. There are a lot of ways you can give other than just writing a check. You might have some extra cash laying around. You might have some extra time. Uh, uh, maybe you made a commitment to do certain things. You know, when we did the building here, many of us made a five-year commitment. Uh, I forgot how long ago that was. Has we worked ten or more years. Uh, Lisa and I still make that. That's part of our offering every week. Is our building thing. way past what we committed? We're still doing it. Uh, you can give assets. Some people give land. We've had someone gave us a bunch of stocks one time that he just said, this, this is a blessing to the church, and we use it in our building program. Uh, some people do it with wills or estates. Uh, some people simply just reduce some of their expenses so that they can give more for purpose, certain purposes. Uh, maybe you can postpone certain want-based spending or redirect completed obligation. Maybe you get done with your car payment. If you're used to putting a couple hundred bucks a month out there, maybe you could make that enough. Just be creative. This is how you do it. You just be creative. What can happen? Now, very quickly, if you're just getting started with, with Christian giving, uh, it may be hard. So here are four quick steps. Number one, just pray about it. Go to God and just say, God, what do you want me to do? And I honestly want you to communicate to me. And God will communicate. I don't know how he'll tell you, but he will. He'll tell you what to do. Secondly, create a budget for yourself that supports tithing. If you don't know how to do that, Financial Peace University starts Wednesday night here. Call up Lisa's Denger and say, I want to be a part of it. Because I don't know what kind of preparation she has to do if we have to do kids. But call her up and tell her, I want to be a part of it. And she, they will, you will learn how to create a budget where you can support your legitimate giving. Number three, then be faithful when you start. And don't give up. And number four, be patient. Because you may not see instant results. And God may not respond right away because he wants to see if you're serious. So you can keep this up or you can just do that to try to milk me. Dr. Craig Good is the author of several great books about Christian giving, uh, which I have learned a lot from. One of them is called Take God at His Word, and the other is called The Rich Toward God. In Take God at His Word, he tells of a mother who wanted to teach her daughter about giving. And, and so, on the way to church, he gave her a quarter, or she gave the little girl a quarter and a dollar. She said, uh, I want you to put one in a coffee plate, whichever one you feel good about. Well, when they were leaving church, the mother asked, which, which did you put in the plate? She said, well, she said, I was going to give the dollar, but... The, the man said just before the collection that we should be cheerful givers, and I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the court. <laughs> um, that may not have been what mom wanted her to learn, but at the heart of the matter is, it's true. She gave what she believed. We do the same thing. We all give according to what we believe. Now, whether we have a little or a lot, whether we give a little or a lot, it's because of what we believe. We truly believe God's going to bless us. And God knows. That's the thing about it. God knows the truth. You can disguise it any way you want, but God knows the truth. He knows where your heart is. I'm going to tell you a story. One more sip. It's delicious. <laughs> I know I've told this story here before. This is your Some of you aren't going to like me when I'm done here. I'm willing to accept that. This is a true story. Now, you may not know who Peter Marshall is. Uh, ben and I know him because he's a, one of the guys that we study in our preaching classes. Do you remember? You studied him, didn't you? Maybe? A little bit. Okay. Anyway, he was preacher at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Okay, now you get to figure that out. That means he's preaching to some pretty heavy hitters. And he preached about tithing. And he preached the same stuff that I said last week and I said last night. The Bible tells us to tithe. It's not a, it's not a, well, maybe you can think about that. No, it says to do it. And if you don't do it, you're stealing from God. That's what the Bible teaches. And so he talked about that. And after church, one of those heavy hitters came up and he talked to him. He said, uh, Pastor, he said, I, I heard everything you said. And I agree with you. I agree with you. That's what God says. He said, but you need to understand something. I make a lot of money. And a tithe for me is many hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know that I can afford to do that. Peter Marshall, tremendously wise man, I got you. I'm with you. So he put his arm on his shoulder, and he said, let's pray. And he said, Lord, my brother here wants to obey you. He understands your word. He wants to obey you. Would you reduce his income so that he can afford that time? <laughs> Here's where you're not going to like me. I don't want you to raise your hand. But who will pray with me? That God will take your offering and multiply by ten, and that will be your income. Who would pray that with me? Here's why I'm asking. That's what I'm going to start praying this morning. I'm going to pray that every day. I'm going to pray that God will give your offering, whatever it is, and He's going to multiply it by 10, and that's what your income is going to be. I don't care if our church has to tank 
because we don't have enough money because God reduces all our income. Because if that happens, it's because we deserve it. Because we're not being faithful. So that's going to be my prayer. Would you pray that with me? God, take my income, multiply by 10, or my offering, multiply by 10, make that my income. You know what? He may do that. And you may not pray it, but I'm going to pray it. I'm going to pray it right now. So maybe you might want, not want to join me in this prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are a giver, that you modeled generous giving to us, you sacrificed everything for us. We have a little bit, and we give a little bit. And you ask that you will look at the offering of every giver in this church, or every non-giver, and you will make their income multiplied by 10 over that offering. Whatever that means to us, that's what I ask you to do.